Hello and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast, a podcast where we talk about why the church is still relevant for us today as we explore themes connected to religion, politics, pop culture, faith, and yes, even the church. Together, we can find out what it means to live into the mission of the church by making disciples. Now, let's get methodical. Hello and welcome to episode two of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. I am your host, the Reverend Andrew Lay, and I am excited to have my better half, Allie, the light of my life, the wind beneath my wings. <laughs> That's so dramatic. And the apple of my eye here on the podcast with me today to talk about faith, food, theology, and agriculture. Allie, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, you're welcome. Now, in the last episode, I mentioned your eye roll when I told you the name of the podcast, so I'm really glad that you're actually willing to come on this show. So I wanted to start off by asking you a question that you probably get a lot. How did you first get interested in agriculture? Because I think a lot of people look at you and see a pretty blonde woman, kind of this girly girl, and they might be surprised that you studied agriculture education. So how did you initially get involved in agriculture? Yeah, so that's actually kind of a weird story. So um, as most people who know me know, I've always been pretty involved in music. Um, I started singing and playing piano when I was a little girl. And in my eighth grade year, the agriculture teacher at my high school, we were actually um, family friends with, and we saw each other at a church event. And he told me that if I took agriculture classes and I joined FFA, that I could sing at Tennessee's FFA State Convention. And so that is the sole reason that I started taking agriculture classes. Um, Pretty much the first week in my ag classes, I took Principles of Horticulture, and I took it with um, Miss Christy Cobble, who is one of my um, biggest mentors now. I really love her, and she's the reason that I do what I do um, in agriculture education. But within the first week of that class, I had fallen in love with agriculture. We worked in the greenhouse, um, and I really enjoyed working with plants, um, and also just managing the agriculture um, greenhouse that was the Meigs County FFA greenhouse. But I really fell in love with it then, and I got super involved in FFA. Um, As most people know, FFA is a national organization that focuses on agriculture and leadership. Um, But my involvement in that really kind of sent me in the direction of being, being an agriculture student in college. So I think if it wasn't for my ag teachers that I probably would have never even gotten introduced into agriculture. But just because I knew I could sing at state convention, I took those classes. So Um, did you ever actually sing at state convention? Oh, yeah. I sang at state convention all four years of high school. And I actually, it was really funny. So I was a state officer for FFA um, in 2016. And the day of our first um, session of state convention, I was really nervous, right? It was my first time, you know, being a state officer in front of like 3,000 kids. And they're like, hey, um, we actually need you to sing the national anthem. So I sang the national anthem at my state convention as well. So I guess I sang five years in a row at state convention. What were some of the other songs you sang? Oh, my gosh. Um, I sang with my sister when she got in high school. And I know we did our, like, classic Seven Bridges Road. (laughs) The Eagles. Yes. Um, I think I sang some Carrie Underwood, maybe even some Reba. Some Reba? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I sang, I sang the whole time I was there, but that ended up taking the back seat. I kind of um, took a step back on my music career and focused mainly on agriculture and on FFA. Um, and I am really glad that I did that because it's the reason I got the scholarships I did at UT. It's the reason I'm involved in most of the things I'm involved in now. Hmm. Yeah, you know, and I think there, there are obviously a number of things that you can study when it comes to agriculture. Um, what, are, what are some of the other agricultural degrees that people pursue, and why did you choose specifically education? What was it about education that really spoke to you? Yeah, so I'll start out telling you a little bit about some other degrees. Um, I've been pretty involved in my college um, at the Herbert College of Agriculture at the University of Tennessee. While... I'm wearing the sweatshirt right now, actually. Oh, yes, you are. Look at that. <laughs> and... Um, I have a lot of friends that are in different departments through our college, so um, degrees you can get at my school. Um, one is Agricultural Leadership, Education, and Communication, so that's my um, major. Um, so in that, we've got Agriculture Education, that's obviously teaching agriculture. Um, most people who teach agriculture teach from middle school to high school, mainly in Tennessee. We teach high school 
and then there is agricultural communications and that is a degree that opens up a ridiculous amount of doors like you can do anything with that I have friends who have a agriculture communications degree that are in law school I have friends who are working at other universities in their um, recruiting areas um, but that is is basically a communications degree that's focused in agriculture. So a lot of people end up at places like Farm Bureau or Farmers Co-op with a degree like that. And then leadership is kind of the same way. Um, but I think all of those are very um, working with people type degrees. And then we've got our working with plants degrees. And so that's plant science. I have a friend who's currently getting his master's in, land, in landscape architecture. And so um, he's going to be working um, a lot of times designing what our landscapes look like. And then there's animal science. So a lot of those people end up going to um, veterinary medicine school. And then there's also like there's also ways that you can study animal science or plant science or even um, our ALEC degrees and end up doing research or working with UT in ways to just better agriculture throughout the state. Then there's forestry and wildlife and fisheries. I always say that there's a place in agriculture for literally every single person because agriculture encompasses everything. Um, I'm student teaching right now, and one of the t-shirts that our kids think is really funny is um, it's a National FFA shirt, and it says naked and hungry on the front, mm -hmm. and on the back it says where you would be without agriculture, um, because that's really what agriculture is. It feeds and clothes everyone, so I think that there, it, it's such a vast field that there's a place there for everyone. I mean, um, y'all have your own college. Yeah, we have at the University of Tennessee just dedicated to agriculture. Yeah, and it's kind of um, this is incredibly complex, and I can't even begin to describe it in a correct way. Um, <laughs> but there's the University of Tennessee Institute of Agriculture, um, and that goes everywhere from like our college to research to advancement to communications to extension, which is um, your 4-H. Um, and your ag extension agents throughout our county. So, I mean, it's it's a pretty big deal. It's one of the biggest, agriculture is one of the biggest commodities in the nation. I mean, it's a really big deal. But for me, um, in agriculture education, like I said earlier, my ag teachers were fantastic, and they, they really made a difference in my life, and I wanted to be able to give that to other students. Um, as far as teaching goes, I was that kid when I was growing up who, like, would write workbooks and make my little sister Ashley, like, fill them out. Yeah, she really loved playing with me. <laughs> was this, like, math or? <laughs> oh, or all what? of them. Oh, yeah, wow. so, like, math, science, English. I'd make workbooks, mm. and I would make, like, big flip charts and put them up upstairs. And we had, like, a desk up there, and I would teach, and Ashley would have to sit there, and she never wanted to play with me. I wonder why. But, <laughs> well, your um, mom was also a teacher. Yeah. Is so, a teacher, I should say. Yeah, my mom, um is finishing up her 27th year of teaching kindergarten right now. And then Bless my... Her heart. <laughs> I know. And then my Nana, um, who actually isn't my grandmother. She's my, I believe, my great aunt. But anyway, I called her Nana, Billy Sue McKenzie. Um, she also taught for 30 years, taught elementary school. And so teaching has been a part of my family for a really long time. But my passion for agriculture really led me in the direction of agricultural education. And so right now, like I said, I'm actually doing my student teaching, and I'm getting to teach small animal science. Um, this week we talked about animal rights versus animal welfare. It's been really fun to kind of see my students um, are really passionate about that topic, actually, whether it's one way or the other. So it's been really fun to kind of facilitate those discussions this week and see where they stand on that. Um, and then I'm teaching plant science, and right now we're talking about feeding the world. Um, so that's been really it's been really interesting. We've been talking about different biotechnologies um, and mm. agricultural practices and advancements since the Green Revolution. Um, and I also teach an SAE class. And so for people who are involved in FFA, that's a really, really common acronym. But for most people, they're like, what on earth is an SAE? Um, and it's a supervised agricultural experience. So it's our students' involvement in agriculture outside of the classroom. So those are the classes that I'm currently teaching. But even within, like, agricultural education in a classroom there are so many different tracks that you can go um, I have a friend who's teaching natural resources right now and um, so there's so many different areas that we get to teach our students about agriculture in and I really love that yeah so um, one thing that you mentioned earlier was that you spent time serving as an FFA state <laughs> officer so and you kind of touched on this really briefly but can you tell me a little bit about FFA kind of what it means and what it's all about. 
Yes, I'll give you my 30-second elevator pitch that I had to <laughs> give my state office year. Um, no, I'm joking. Um, yes, I'm a FFA has. What do you say elevator <laughs> so, like explain that a little bit <laughs> there there was just always this question that they would ask state officers um hypothetically when we were practicing for interviews and stuff you know if you're on an elevator with someone and they're wearing an and you're wearing your ffa jacket and they ask you what that jacket means what would you tell them um and that right. was just no i'm not giving it <laughs> no no, no. Um, so imagine we're in an elevator right i'm not now. answering that question <laughs> and um, you're standing next to me in your ffa jacket and i ask you what would you say? No, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> I t- I'm not answering that ever again, but it's okay. So the, we had to answer interview questions like that literally all the time. But um, it, it was actually a thing that happened a lot. We would be in elevators or trains or planes. And what's what's your jacket trains. mean? Yeah, like really? the metro, like when I was in D.C. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. So, so it, have, it was something that did happen. It actually happened a lot, so it was really good that we had that set <laughs> answer. Um, but, yeah, people would always ask, what's your blue corduroy jacket? Um, and we would have to tell them. But, yeah, so FFA is a it's a national youth organization, the largest one, actually. I think now we have over 600,000 members. Really? It's the largest one? Mm-hmm. I did not know that. Yeah. So, like, is YMCA considered a youth organization? No. I, don't, I don't know. Oh, okay. Sorry. I don't know. I just didn't know. All right. <laughs> I've never been a part of a Y, so <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Anyway. But, yes, yeah, so FFA's largest youth organization. Wow. We've got over 600,000 members. I think it's like 655,000. I have no idea. Hmm. But um, it's grown exponentially since even I was a part of it. But... What we do is we focus on agriculture and leadership. Our mission statement is to develop premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agricultural education. Um, And so through that, we have different career and leadership development events with students. So essentially contests that they can be a part of. So with that, there's job interview. There's extemporaneous public speaking where our students draw a topic out of a hat and they have 30 minutes to prepare and they give a five to seven minute speech over it prepare public speaking where they write a speech about a different agricultural topic or issue we've got parliamentary procedure i mean that doesn't even break ground on how many things we do there's different livestock judging competitions um i can't even think of all of them there's so many and then there's their sae areas that i talked a little bit about earlier that they can get proficiencies in which is a contest where they write down all they do in their SAE we have a winner for each region and then we have a state proficiency winner it's a really big deal and they get some scholarship money for that but so like I think there's like a lot of life skills too that folks can can oh yeah I always I always say I could not do an interview if it wasn't for FFA (laughs) like I feel so confident in my interview skills and my communication skills and my leadership skills all because of what I learned in FFA Mm. Um, it definitely puts students on a really great path to be successful. And so that's part of actually being an agriculture teacher is you're also an FFA advisor. That's something I'm really looking forward to because I, I can't wait for students to kind of find their potential in that organization. All right, so what was it like serving as an FFA state officer? <laughs> it was wild. Um, we did so much in the span of one year that it was absolutely insane. It was crazy. Um, I feel like we just finished up our set office year yesterday, but I guess it's been, I guess it's been four years now. It's funny. The high schoolers don't know who I am anymore. I've expired. <laughs> You've expired. Um, yeah. So when you talk about kind of your officer team, what, who all did uh, that include? Like what were the roles yeah. that were within that team? So we had a president, obviously. Um, we had three vice presidents. So the way that that looked is there's East, Middle, and West. I was the East Tennessee State Vice President. Um we kind of represented our region on the state officer team. So we had, re- like, our titles may have said our region, but we were state officers. That's kind of confusing sometimes. Um, and then there's the reporter, the treasurer, the secretary, and the sentinel. Um, so how that works is you go through about a three-day interview, three- or two-day interview process at state convention in March. Um, and then you work a convention job. Um, which could be anything from recording career development events to working backstage um, to helping with talent. But you do this, and then on the last day of convention, it's always a Wednesday, um, they elect the new officer team. And it is like the craziest thing in the world. They play that like Chicago Bulls song. 
Um, I know you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah. But they play it, and then they call out your name. And you run up to the stage, and it's this big deal. And then there's confetti. And, and, and you they talk. like do they like call it out like they would like Michael Jordan? Yes. You know? yeah. Yes. It's like a sports team. It's ridiculous. And then you you go up there, and there's like, boom, confetti. Everybody's like screaming and crying. Then you hit like this insane gavel like it's massive you all do it together to like adjourn the last session of convention and usually they play like a fun song so everybody's like really excited but sometimes they play fishing in the dark by the nitty gritty band and that's what they played when (laughs) my team hit the gavel fishing in the dark it was so funny and so every time we hear that now we laugh and always dance with each other but so you get elected with these people who some of them you've met at a prep course because they do state officer prep courses because it's like hardcore cutthroat stuff and some of you met maybe at a prep course. Some of them maybe you met literally that week when you ran. Um, About how many people are running? Uh, I don't remember. It's normally somewhere from like 25 to like maybe 40. And they elect eight wow. people. And so there's... So very competitive. It's incredibly competitive. And so there's a nominating committee of six students, six FFA members, um, And then six people in the agriculture industry. So this could look like someone who works at a university. um, Maybe someone who works for a farm bureau or co-op or the Cattlemen's Association. So people like that. So there's a 12-person non-com. So six FFA members, six uh, business or industry leaders. Hmm. And they they go through and they score your interviews. And then they, they choose the team based on that. And so you get elected with these people who... You really like you. You might know them, but you really don't know them that well unless you've maybe went to camp with them as a freshman or something. Um, so you all get elected. You run on stage. You all hug each other, and then you go to this um, banquet afterwards. It's really great, um, and then you literally start. You start the next weekend um, for state training, and it's so funny how within seven days these seven other people that you really don't know actually do become your best friends like it's it's really bizarre I mean one of well actually two of the people that were on my state officer team are a part of our wedding day yeah so it's um, coming up soon yeah (laughs) and what is it 84 days yeah yeah so something like that (laughs) so Sam (laughs) Sam and Taylor um, are two of my best friends they were on my state officer team and one's a bridesmaid and one's an usher I mean they're two of my very best friends all all seven of the people on that team are seven of my best friends we all still talk essentially every day Um, But you go through this whole year and you go visit different high school chapters and do fun leadership workshops and agricultural um, literacy workshops. You meet with different industry leaders. Um, Who are some of the people that you met with? Oh, gosh. Um, Well, it's actually funny you asked that. So today that today we're filming this is what day is it? February 29th. So it's the last day of National FFA week. Um, so on that week, we go on like this goodwill tour. Um, and it's basically what it is. It's a tour where you're touring the state and you're passing on goodwill. So you're um, <laughs> talking to all these different people. I um, mean, that week we went. Not affiliated with the goodwill like store. Store, no. No, right. no it's not. <laughs> Unfortunately. Separate, separate thing. Um, yeah. So that week we went, oh my goodness, we went to Sweetwater Valley Farms. We went to the Farmers Co-op in Laverne which is headquarters. We went to Tennessee Farm Bureau headquarters in Columbia. We went to we went to Paris, Tennessee and met with their FFA chapter, which was really fun. We went to Ducks Unlimited. We went to the I think it's the Ag- Agra International Center. I could be saying that completely wrong. But um, it's an international ag center in Memphis. Hmm. Um, we went wow, there. Wow, so just like all the way across all, the state. All the universities. So to, wow. So we went to UT Knoxville, UT Martin, Middle Tennessee State University, Tennessee Tech University, and Tennessee State University. So the only other university in the state that we didn't hit that does agriculture is Austin P. So we went to every hmm. other place. Um Oh my gosh, we did so much. I know I'm missing so many things, but we literally meet with a million people that wait week. It's nuts. Like you're, you start out in like, we started out, I think in East Tennessee, we actually um, went to my church, which was really fun. And then we went the rest of the week, ended up like in Jackson and Memphis and then back to Murfreesboro all in like a span of like 48 hours it was really yeah. crazy so you spend the whole week traveling and meeting with students and meeting Jeez. with different industry leaders so that wow. was crazy 
And then I'm tired just thinking about that. <laughs> well, yeah, we slept none. It was great. And then there was like one day where we were in the car. We were leaving um, Paris High School. Well, I think it's Henry County High School, actually. Yeah, it's just the Paris FFA chapter. And we were trying to get to, you know, in Paris, Tennessee, they have like a mock Eiffel Tower. And we had to take pictures at it, obviously. <laughs> so, I did not know that. Yeah, it's really cool. So we were leaving the high school. And um, Stina Meadows, who was our... Um, regional consultant um, just lightly says, hey guys, I'm seven miles till empty, so if one of you could find a gas station, because we had driven <laughs> so much, we just forgotten to get gas, so we had to find a gas station so we could get to the Eiffel Tower, but I mean, no, it's Eiffel pretty Tower. much, oh, and that, we we wrapped up that week at f and Bank in Clarksville, and we had like some really nice dinner on the, on the like top floor of this building, um, it, mm. it was really, really cool and really, really nice. And there, there was a lot of state senators and representatives. Um, so that was neat. That's another thing we did that week. I just remembered. It was super cool. We spoke on the House floor. We, um, oh, had yeah. A, just yeah. on the House floor. Yeah, we had a, well, <laughs> in Tennessee, we had a legislative right. breakfast. So that was really fun. And the governor came. Wow. Um, that was when you went to the governor, was governor. Uh, You went to the we governor's did, mansion. Yeah, I did go to the governor's mansion. We were invited there for Christmas. Our team decorated a Christmas tree for the governor's mansion. Wow. So that was Spent really fun. Christmas morning with the governor. It was not Christmas <laughs> morning. Um, but, yeah, so we did that. And that was when Bill Haslam was governor. So we got to meet with him and um, his wife. And we met with his wife at the governor's mansion and met with him at the legislative breakfast. I mean, it was funny because I was also – we so we were state officers 2016 to 17. So it was presidential election year, and then the people who were going to start running for Haslam's position as his term was wrapping up were starting to, like, come out of the woodworks, you know? Mm. So I remember um, taking pictures with some people and um, our now Governor Bill Lee coming up to me and standing there talking to him for about 20 minutes, and we took a picture together, and it's funny because he's the governor now. Um, But that's a really cool day um, that we get to do. We get to meet with all of those state representatives and senators, and so that's a that's a yeah. really really cool day, a really cool experience. But so that's we do that in February, which is the week before our state convention. So when we kind of run and chair convention, but oh my gosh, we do so much more than that. I mean, the year is insane. There's so many different training events we go to, and so many different um, agriculture events across the state. Um, one really cool thing that we did now, all of this has changed because like I said, I'm ancient in the FFA world now, but we did national leadership conference for state officers. So it's usually like you and five other states go somewhere. So we went to Helen, Georgia, Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and did a leadership kind of, maybe it was a five day thing. I don't really remember. It's been a while, but, um, we did a lot of different training for facilitation and then we got to kind of go out and adventure in Helen. So we went and um, inner tube down the Chattahoochee, which was really fun. We sang the Alan Jackson song the whole time, <laughs> way down yonder on the Chattahoochee. So that was yeah. fun. But um, we also, um, some of my team, not all of us um, did, but most of us got to be a part of what was called the International Leadership Seminar for State Officers. And that was where we traveled to South Africa for two weeks and kind of studied agriculture and leadership. And so that was really fun. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. So you were there for two weeks. Yes. And tell me about what was your experience like there? What were some of the things that you did while you were there in South Africa? What were some of the places you went to? Yeah, so um, it's, it was a really, really, really amazing two weeks. So we start out in D.C. I think now they start out in New York. Like I said, I'm, I'm ancient. Everything I'm saying is not relevant <laughs> to FFA anymore. But um, so we started out in D.C., and we do like a two-day training, so they train you to be culturally aware when you visit another country. Because, Very important. Very yeah, important. incredibly important. We were not allowed to pack things or wear things that screamed like, hey, I'm from America, um, yeah. because it's really culturally inappropriate to wear American flag shorts while you're touring um, the, you know, maybe the Apartheid Museum, maybe you don't right. know that. Yeah. And so um, we, we went through a lot of cultural training on that to kind of see where our cultural awareness and empathy fell, which was really neat. And so we did that for two days and then we got on a plane and I think we were, oh my gosh, I think we were on a plane for like 24 hours total, um, Mm -hmm. based on like stopping for gas. So we kind of stopping for gas. Yeah. We had to to stop to fill up for gas in like Ghana, I think. Wow. And then we flew down to Johannesburg. So we spent the first week in Johannesburg. 
We toured, I say Johannesburg, we went all over the place. Um, Kind of the upper part of South Africa, we essentially were all over the whole country. But that week, oh my goodness, I don't even remember all that we did and where we were when we did it. But so we spent time in Johannesburg and time in in Cape Town. Um, So some of like the highlights for me were going to see the Mandela statue, which I believe is in Johannesburg, yes. And that was really, really cool to see just that giant Mandela statue. And we got to spend time at the Apartheid Museum and really learn about what all they went through. And something that was kind of wild for all of us visiting South Africa was, you know, Mandela didn't become president in South Africa until 1996. Mm. Um, Not a long time ago. He died my sophomore year of high school. So all of this stuff that feels so long ago and feels like history it's not i mean that was not long ago things were happening there that were horrendous i mean Mm -hmm. 25 years ago absolutely and so just kind of seeing the way that their country is trying to kind of bounce back from that was really interesting it definitely was and then we got to one of my favorite things that we did was we got to go um, up to Table Mountain, mm-hmm. which was unreal. It's se- one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Um, it was indescribable. Like it was one of those things where you get up there and like there's no words. Like all you can, all you can do is really just like pray. Like you just wow. kind of sit there and like in, in just complete awe. Like there's really nothing you can say. Um, it was unbelievable. You're overlooking Cape Town, overlooking the ocean. It was, it was, in, it was completely indescribable. Um, but I think my number one favorite thing we did was we got to go to Robbins Island and while we were, you know, that's where Mandela was incarcerated. And so, and he was there for how many, I mean, a number of years. Yeah. I can't really remember, but off the top of my head right now, but we got to see, you know, his, his cell, like where, where he lived in prison, um, was really powerful, really moving. And something special that Robbins Island does just to kind of remind people that, hey, this that happened to us was not that long ago, is they have people who you, who were inmates there for, um, like, race crimes, for trying to stick up for, like, what was right, that had, had been there for sticking up for what was right. So people mm-hmm. who maybe were a part of Mandela's group um, that were in jail at Robbins Island were actually tour guides. Yeah. And so the person who gave me my tour of Robbins Island was a previous inmate. And it was hard for him. I mean, there were times where when he would talk to us, he would get choked up um, just talking about his experiences there at Robbins Island. And it was it was very powerful, very moving. Um, and so another thing we got to see there was there's this limestone quarry. And apparently... Um, Several years ago, there was some form of conference there, and Mandela was there, um, and he just kind of slipped out um, of the conference and mm-hmm. went to the limestone quarry and began moving the limestone into a pile. And people asked him, you know, what he was doing, and he essentially, um, I'm going to try to explain this as eloquently as possible, but essentially, he was moving the limestone, you know, in honor of those people. Wow. Wow. Um, that had to do that while they were there at Robbins Island. And so the whole conference then moved from their conference room and came down and moved the limestone with Mandela. Um, and so we get to kind of see that pile of um, rock that they moved. And that was, that was, that was really moving, but overall just a really great trip to kind of learn about their agriculture there. We got to visit different farms. They have a lot of vineyards there, um, which was really cool to see like how they um, did their viticulture and, South African wine is actually compared to wine of, like, Italy. So it's a really big Mm. deal. Um, But all of us were (laughs) not 21, and (laughs) which in South Africa, you know, didn't matter. The drinking age was 18, and we all were that. But we signed a code of ethics when we Uh, became state officers, so none of us got to try the wine. Um, Uh, We had some, like, sparkling grape juice, um, so we got to do that. That's good. Um, It was funny, but... So that was a really cool thing. We got to go see. Um, we went to a boar goat farm. Oh my gosh, which was insane wow. because boar goats are super cool. Like that's one of my one of my weird animals that I actually <laughs> like. I'm weird about animals. Boar goats are really cool and they're huge. And so we go to this boar goat farm. Um, and he told us about how he um 
artificially inseminates his poor goats and then how he actually like sells that semen like because it's such a big deal and he's yeah. got such a great farm and so this man is like really nice and he like casually says like i want to be the coca-cola of poor goats my first like <laughs> i have like this papa complex you know where like anytime yeah. there's an older man i just want him to be my granddad because i love him immediately mm-hmm. and so he says that and i was like oh my god he's so sweet i love him and then he was like well, let me give you get you guys a drink let me take you up to um one of our houses and get a drink and so I was like, okay. So we get up to this guy's house. And the second we see it, I'm like, oh, he was serious. Like, this man actually wants to be the Coca-Cola of Borgos. He's rich. Like, oh, he wow. was crazy rich. And you, it was just nuts because we get up to this guy's house and he has, like, a giant sword hanging over a door. <laughs> and it was, like, gifted to him from... I don't even know. Some like Sheba in another country was wow. nuts. And so I was like, oh, like he, that was that wasn't like a sweet goal. But that was actually like something yeah. that he was working You're towards like, all accomplishing. This sweet papa guy. Oh no, he's for no, real. No, he's for real. Um, <laughs> so that was really cool to learn about, like his poor goats and their um, insemination process. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, all the different farms we visited were just really, really neat. Um, we learned so much about agriculture and like how their growing seasons are so much different than ours and. When we got there, they had been in a drought for a relatively long time. And mm. when, like, it was, like, maybe our third day, it started raining. And it poured for, like, two days. And all of us were, like, so annoyed, right? Because yeah. we're, like, are you serious? Like, we just got to Africa and it's raining. Like, yeah. we can't go. We had planned to go to this farmer's market. And we couldn't go. And we were all, like, super selfish Wanted about it. Go sightsee. Yeah. All these we were, like, seriously, it's raining. We can't do anything. And yeah. then about, so all of us were complaining, annoyed. And then we got to a farm, and this guy grew um, avocados and maybe bananas. I can't remember mm. what else. Um, and the first thing he said was, like, how wonderful is this rain? Mm. Like, they were so excited because they have been in a drought for so long. And so that was kind of eye-opening to just realize, oh, okay, wow. we're really selfish. And so that was kind of a cool lesson to learn. But overall, it was just a really great trip. We got to learn so much more than just agriculture. Yeah. Well, you know, I think I think this is hopefully going to be helpful for a lot of people because I think a lot of people have this stereotypical idea about what agriculture is. Mm-hmm. And they think it's like a, about a bunch of cows and farmers with straw hats. Mm-hmm. But why do you think agriculture is important for everyone to study and understand? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons, but um, one, so if you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, every one of them in some way relate back to agriculture. I mean, number one is no poverty, and number two is zero hunger for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. That directly affects agriculture. Yeah. um, Because poverty is normally one of the leading reasons to food insecurity, which is number two, no hunger. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that, and like I said earlier, you know, naked and hungry, that's where you'd be without agriculture. But the way that we choose to farm and produce our food and produce um, textiles and fibers directly impacts every single person. Um, with our population that's expected to grow somewhere between 9 to 11 billion by 2050, agriculture has to has to make sure that we can do that, that we can provide for that population surge. And so I think that just agriculture is important for everybody because if we don't figure that out and if we don't support our farmers and our ranchers and our agriculturalists, then, you know, where do we go? What do we do when we don't have food and we yeah. don't have clothes? Um, and like I said, it I mean, it directly impacts every single person. Well, that's something I wanted to touch on. You, you talked about food insecurity. Mm-hmm. Um, can you kind of define that for, for folks and then talk a little bit about about why that's a problem? I think you have have to a degree, but can you, can you just define what that means and maybe talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so food insecurity is essentially when people aren't getting um, the nutrition um, that they need and people aren't getting the amount of food, the amount of nutrition, the amount of calories – um, pretty much all of your essential things that come with eating, when people aren't getting that, that Or maybe even like the access. Yeah, to so um, I had I took a class in college, and we talked about the three, three kind of parts of food insecurity, and those being availability, accessibility, and affordability. Mm. Okay, so with that, 
so access to food. Um, I'll kind of talk about my personal experience growing up. So I grew up in Decatur. Um, not a lot in Decatur. I love Decatur. Go Tigers. You know. Decatur, Tennessee. Yes, Decatur, Tennessee. <laughs> um, I love it there, but where I lived was about 40 minutes from the closest Walmart. And we did have a Piggly Wiggly in Decatur, so that was kind of everybody's main source of groceries. Um, but my family didn't really have much access when it came to, you know, fresh food. And there was a, so we only had our Piggly Wiggly, but other than that, like we really had to travel if we wanted to buy groceries somewhere else or if the pig didn't have something that we needed. So we didn't really have much access to food. Um, so that was, that's kind of a big thing. So especially globally, I mean, there are people who walk three miles for fresh water. Um, so access is just a really big thing. Like, can you get to food? Like maybe there is food, but can you get to it? Mm -hmm. Um, and then for affordability, that's um, pretty standard there. Can you afford the food? Is the food, food affordable? Maybe if you only have one place to buy food, they've got a monopoly on the market. Uh, maybe it's a little bit more expensive than what you can afford. Um, maybe Fresh people, food is, is expensive. Yeah, me and Andrew have been trying to eat healthy um, for our wedding, and we're <laughs> so poor. Like, it's so much cheaper for me to buy a dollar taco at the Taco Bell than it is for me to buy, you know, yeah, lettuce. <laughs> like t- Domino's Pizza. Oh my gosh, yes. Now I want Domino's. <laughs> but, I mean, it's... That's a problem. Yeah, so it's problem. cheaper to eat like trash than it is yeah. to eat healthy and kind of get the nutrition that you need. So that affordability is a huge concern. Are people making enough money to even buy food to provide for their families? Are they it, are their grocery stores around them affordable um, for the food that they need? Mm. And then availability. So, like, is there food available? In the United States, we do a pretty good job of making sure that our grocery store shelves are always stocked with food. Um, I've never been to the grocery store and they've been empty. You know, yeah. like, we go to the grocery store and there's there's normally food. Um, but in a lot of countries, that's not necessarily the case. Mm. Like you can go to a grocery store and maybe they're out of a lot of your fresh food and maybe it's not available. And then there's places, you know, like inner cities where maybe there's not a grocery store that serves fresh food. Maybe there's a gas station or maybe there's, you know, a CVS or Walgreens type deal, but they don't have fresh food. They may have like some cans or they may have, you know, um, ramen noodles, but that's not necessarily um, what someone needs to survive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so is is that food available? Maybe you have access to a store, um, but is what you need available? Yeah. Um, and so those three things are a really big deal when it comes to like food insecurity or food deserts. Mm, food deserts, yeah, that's a good, good term. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I think we see examples of Jesus and how he engages in themes of agriculture. Mm-hmm. You know, Jesus often tells parables that, relate to farming and agriculture. You know, we we see him, his first miracle, turning water into wine Mm -hmm. at a wedding in Cana. He fed 5,000 people, and then I think later he feeds 4,000 people, Mm -hmm. not even including the women and children. And so I think food insecurity is something that Jesus deeply cares about. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the church's responsibility is in addressing food insecurity? Yeah, so I think personally that the church has a moral obligation to work and efforts to food insecurity. Um, I think it's in John, maybe, where Jesus asks Simon Peter, you know, do you love me? And he's like, yeah, and he says, then feed my lambs. Um, And I think that's a big job of the church to go out and, you know, literally feed Feed people, feed Jesus' lambs. And so, yeah, I think that the church really does have a moral obligation to, to to help people who are living their lives food insecure mm-hmm. um and i think and andrew you can maybe expand on this but i think keith united methodist where andrew is the associate pastor um, actually does do a lot of work for food insecurity mm-hmm. um, with your nourish one child yeah a ministry here that p- provides food for for kids over the weekend in the mm-hmm. city schools who otherwise might not have the access um, or the affordability to, to get that food uh, themselves and so um, yeah, I think there's backpack programs or mm-hmm. ways that churches can, can address this problem. Food uh, kitchens or food mm-hmm. pantries, things like that. I think that ministries like that where the church is actually like feeding people, I think, are amazing. I think that 
working with your local communities on things like that are going to be what makes a difference. I think get in touch with your school system. Mm. Get in touch with your lawmakers. You know, make actual big efforts to feed people. I mean, there are so many kids who go to school and that meal that they get at their lunch table is the only meal that they're going to see that day. Mm. And for for any Christian, that should bother you. Yeah. You should hear yeah. that, and it should make you uncomfortable, and it should make you want to get out and make you want to do work. Um, and I think that that is something that's so big for agriculturalists is we hear that, and it bothers us. And so we go out and we do the work, whether that's farming or that's working with biotechnology to develop genetically modified organisms to grow in different climates or to have better nutritional values. Um, we're going out and we're doing the work. We are pro- we are producing enough food in the world to feed everyone. Mm. We're doing it. Wow. Agriculturalists are doing it. Um, problem is food waste. Um, the United States is terrible for food waste because our portion size is out of control. Yeah. And so we aren't feeding people because we're wasteful. We're wasteful, um, yeah. And I think that we can all f- work together for a solution for this, but I think a lot of it starts with us just being responsible um, for, with like what we have. Like If you've got cans that you've not opened and you're – you know, in your cabinet for six months, take them to the food pantry. Yeah. You don't eat them. You're not going to use them. Mm-hmm. They've been snared for six months. Take it to the food pantry. Right. Um, I mean, just seeing when people are in need um, is really important. So I think that, you know, people are people just have to realize, like, we can all work together to kind of solve this problem of hunger. Kids, not just kids, but kids and their parents, people who don't have kids, you know, mm-hmm. all forms of people. No one should be going going to bed hungry. Nobody should live their life thinking when's my next meal going to be. And so I think I think it's a big responsibility of the church to say, "Hey, this is a problem. Let's work to fix it. How are we going to fix it?" And maybe that's churches getting um in touch with their local farmers and saying, "Hey, we'd really like to start a program with you. Maybe um we can kind of work together to feed these people. Maybe you can provide us with some fresh food to give to families." Um but I think just working together as a community to step up and say, hey, this isn't okay, is, I think, I think that even could make a small difference just in our local communities. And, you know, that's easy for us to say, like, hey, let's work to, towards food insecurity, but it's harder to, you know, go out and do it. And so I think just actually taking action, and instead of, you know, just me and you sitting here talking about food insecurity, you know, how are me and you, Andrew, mm-hmm. actually working to, like, feed hungry people? Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think action is is the biggest is the biggest thing. Now I cannot solve all the problems for food insecurity, and I think that <laughs> um, I mean I think biotechnology is huge, and just overall advancements in technology and agriculture practices play a big role. Um, and that's kind of the million dollar question in agriculture right now: How are we going to feed this growing population? Mm. Um, but I think that should be a big question for the church as well. You know, we we get asked that all the time in college agriculture students how are we going to feed the world how are we going to feed the world i think that the statistic of nine to billion nine to eleven billion people are going to be in the world and we got to feed them you know how are we going to fix that should be just as big of a question in the church yeah because here's the thing we've got the food to feed everybody in the world right now and we're still not doing it Mm -hmm. so Yeah. yeah absolutely so if there was one thing you wish everyone could know when it comes to agriculture just one thing what would it be I think that it does affect everyone. I think that so often we hear agriculture, and like you, you kind of touched on earlier, we think about farming, we think about um, people wearing, you know, straw hats. I guess as you refer <laughs> to, and stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, farmers are a massive, massive, probably the biggest part of agriculture is actually producing, producing what we need, but it impacts everybody. Mm. And I've touched on that time and time again, but. If you eat, you're involved in agriculture. You have a pet, you're involved in agriculture. You wear clothes, guess what? Involved in agriculture. <laughs> and so I think just knowing that it impacts everyone is important. And to to support agriculture, I mean, oh my gosh, in the news right now, it drives me up a wall that like people are slamming the dairy industry. We take calves away from their moms right after they were born. Yeah, to give them colostrum because if we don't in the first 24 hours of their life, they could die. Yeah. It's like, yeah, we have to. Um, 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we're slam- we're slamming dairy industry. We're slamming the meat industry. Um, no farmer is going to feed you food that they wouldn't feed their own family. Mm-hmm. Um, this is people's livelihoods. I've there. I've never seen anybody love their animals the way that farmers love their animals. And so I think just supporting our farmers. I think agriculturalists are are the future. They have to be the future. Because no matter what changes, we still have to feed people. Yeah. And I think just supporting supporting them. I mean, like I said, the media right now is so hateful towards agriculture. And if we want to see change, we want to see people fed, and we want to you know, increase our production levels as population increases, we've got to support. And maybe that starts with education. Maybe that starts mm-hmm. with people having conversations like this where we talk about agriculture and we talk about the things that agriculturalists are doing, but I think support and community outreach and education are a really big step in the right direction. And so if anybody can get anything out of hearing me drawn on and on and on about agriculture <laughs> is that it does impact you and it's so important to support these people who are going out in the fields and that are putting in the work. Um, and buy milk. Buy, <laughs> buy. <laughs> yes, buy milk. Mayfield milk. <laughs> yes, we love Mayfield. But like support your local dairy, support your local farmers. Um I mean, we are seeing so many markets crash right now because of yeah. plant-based meat, which which is great for the plant industry, and I love plants. But like, you know, let's not we neglect. Can, yeah, yeah, we can so we can support our plant industry, and people can eat plant-based meat, and people can eat. I mean, people can drink soy and almond milk, especially for those people who are lactose intolerant. We can do all those things without making our cattle industry look like the bad guy. Mm. Um, and so I think that's a big thing in media right now. It's just. Just supporting them. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Allie, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I've really <laughs> enjoyed just to sit down and having this conversation with you. It's just been awesome to uh, share this time with you. This is what Andrew listens to in the car when I get fired up about That's right. something. He has to sit and listen to me talk about buying milk all the time. <laughs> so now you guys have to hear there it too. Go. No, seriously, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, I hope you might consider heading on over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review of the show. It is very much appreciated. And until next time, stay methodical.